So what would a United States built on unity look like? And so I was attempting to describe that in Atlantean democracy. So to begin to understand how to include everybody, you need to kind of understand the hidden history as well as what the traditional canon uh, may or may not tell you. So just like in a personal relationship, getting to know each other's told history and then the untold history begins, begins to come out as you begin to trust them and sometimes it's nice and sometimes it's not so nice but the baggage that people hide, right? So part of the untold history is the baggage that still exists. So it's useful to know what people carry even if they're, what kind of baggage they carry even if they're no longer aware of it or might be ashamed of it. So our neighbor to the south, so to speak, Mexico, once ended 10 miles south of Ashland and included all the states which have Spanish names, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Tejas, etc. So Guerrero. Don't know why this is repeated, so let's skip this in the mix. Ah. All right. So, in attempting to create an African-style culture where human diversity is utilized rather than suppressed within the context of whatever society you're in is difficult. But concerns about social justice remain the norm. Guerrero attempted to create a cross-cultural model in Mexico, blending native, African, and European culture for his particular society, and he was assassinated. So I say this not to dissuade you from making the attempt, but to instruct you on the challenges of the waters you would tread if you were going to try to implement social justice. You need a chart. So how do you understand uh, cross -cult different cultures? So different cultures sometimes devise uh, ways of understanding others so that you can begin to learn. So within uh, the construct of this class, uh, a cross-cultural model, uh, one, of the more, one of the more popular cross-cultural models among black people is Edwin Nichols' axiology. So axiology. So, in axiology, uh, which is actually a part of philosophy, but at this construct, so philosophy comes out of the traditional canon of Western civilization, but black people operating in higher ed will often take concepts and morph them. And this is being done with uh, this construct called axiology. So often when you hear this construct, uh, and doc referred to Dr. Edwin Nichols. Uh, Dr. Nichols is a uh, black industrial psychologist. And what an industrial psychologist does is they study organizations to see how they operate and how people operate within them. Since you understand that Western psychology doesn't recognize that racism exists as a construct, Obviously, a black person growing up in the United States, educated in Europe, becoming multilingual, multiliterate, being aware of many of those histories. So a lot of that history stuff um, that I was raised with in uh, the aquarium bookstore in terms of having a set of books, like my grandfather had a set of J.A. Rogers books that I am now the family keeper of that, and I incorporated that into this class. I had that knowledge suppressed in myself. So, for example, when I got moved from schools in South Central to going to white schools in Bel Air, uh, when I was shown a picture of Beethoven and it was my grandfather that had basically told me about black Jesus and black Beethoven and Afro-Europeans, and I'm like 10 years old and I'm sitting in this mostly white school and they're talking about slavery and all the white kids. You can feel all the white kids turning and looking at you and, you know, slave, 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 right? Because that's all they're talking about. And then 
they show a, they have a bust of Beethoven and a picture of Beethoven and then he's got long wavy hair and he's got a sharp pointy nose like Michael Jackson's instead of the flat one that uh, J.A. Rogers shows within his particular books. Um, and that's what I was raised on and I raised my hand and I said, that's not Beethoven, Beethoven was black. And so in 1965 they go, Mark, Beethoven wasn't black. He was German. So what does his nationality have to do with his race? There are black Germans. Oh, Mark, no. You're, black people are from Africa. There are no black people in Europe. Ha, 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 ha. And the entire class is laughing at me. So, okay. The teacher is saying I'm stupid for saying Beethoven is black uh, without evidence. And the evidence is in, you know, my grandfather's house. So I hadn't gotten the books because grandma, you know, grandpa had been dead by that point, so or was going to be dead. Let's see, sixty-five. He's going to be dead in three years. So the books were in his house. So I had no proof, right? So I just had to take, you know, people ridiculing me. Oh, Afro-European? No, you're just slaves. The best you can be is an American, you know, because we civilized you. I mean, that was the message. Now that was not the message I got at home, but all this to say. Right, that Nichols, the, the next time that I saw a picture of black Beethoven and Charlotte and Pushkin was when Edwin Nichols came to school district 4J in the 80s talking about axiology. And part of his event, uh, this was before computers were sophisticated, so he was doing uh, transparencies on an overhead. And so he had pictures of um, the first in the Ans Ans Anselm Furstenberg Breitling von Meldig picture, you know, so the, the black guy on the top of the uh, shield. He had pictures of Schwarzkopf's family crest and Schwarzenegger's family crest. And I came up to him and said, wow, where did you get this? He said, it's in Rogers. I said, wait, J.A. Rogers? He said, yes. Sex and race? Yes. Wow. Gee, and then he mentioned offhand, uh, I said, I, my grandfather had those books, and uh, my dad has some of those things. He said, who's your father? Hi, wild the hair. Oh, I know your father. Okay, right. Black shrinks know each other. So, let's go to slide. The philosophical value. So, with grateful thanks <laughs> to African-American industrial psychologist Dr. Edwin Nichols, who developed these philosophical constructs. So, in philosophy, as a discipline within the traditional canon, axiology studies the, is the philosophical study of values. So what Nichols did with this is he basically said, okay, where do these values around race come from? Because if racism that we're operating on is only 600, 600 or 700 years old, then people had a way of working with each other before this particular form of racism was developed because this form of racism did not exist among the Greeks and the Romans because they had black people, they were multiracial societies, the Romans had black generals, the Greeks you know, were studying in black universities so they had positive ideas about black people in the ancient world so what happened to form these negative uh, values? Well. Dr. Nichols, clinical industrial psychologist working in organized develop, organizational development and is the director of Nichols and Associates Incorporated. It's an applied behavioral science firm affecting technolo technology transfer to organizations based on principles of philosophy and basic behavioral sciences. Technology transfer that he's talking about refers to a construct he developed which allows people to utilize perceivable differences. He's committed to helping organiza organizations achieve systemic congruence through cultural competence, thus assuring a competitive edge. So one of the things that he's saying is if you're going to be competitive in the future, because he's writing this basically in the mid-80s, where they are predicting a demographic shift uh, to be occurring around year 2000 and then beyond, where basically we are shifting from 
a majority white society to a majority minority society and how do you basically begin to eliminate some of the systemic barriers uh, to excellence. And so one of the things that he's saying, the technology transfer is you need a model to be able to understand where the other cult uh, culture is coming from that requires that you know some of their history, some of their hidden belief systems, and the origins of all those things. And axiology is an attempt to do that. So he was educated at Assumption College, Windsor, Canada. So he's not even educated in America, even though there is a cultural context they couldn't assume that there is some similarity because they're speaking English. He was also uh, educated at Everhard Karls Universität in Tübingen, Germany. Uh, Leopold Franzen Universität Innsbruck, Austria, where he received his Doctor of Philosophy in Psychology and Psychiatry, cum laude. So as evident in his presentations, uh, Ed speaks multiple languages. Notice this pattern. <laughs> okay, so black Americans going abroad, doing excellent because they might not get the same treatment in American institutions, and they come back speaking multiple languages, which is part of that particular genome. So he developed this construct to help people from different cultural backgrounds work together. So any kind of strategic planning naturally involves conflict. Potentially, in who is considered a leader, what kinds of power do those leaders wield? What kind of power do they have? What kind of power can they delegate to others? and how is power lost and gained. So these are all concepts within leadership that are culturally bound. So what is the culture of those who are in power and the, what is the culture of those who are powerless within that culture? If power isn't distributed equally, how is it concentrated and who decides who's a leader and who will be listened to and who isn't? So there's a hidden dimension to culture that defines though those and other questions. So the question is not simply who decides which cultures are in operation, it is detecting which cultures are in operation for yourself and making the appropriate adjustment for your own actions. And sometimes these cultures operating are invisible, yet they are detectable, you can feel them. It's kind of like it's an atmosphere of power. And so when there's a power vacuum, then if you're going to operate in a power vacuum for the type of power that you're used to dealing with, you need some kind of protection so that you keep your power together while you're operating in a power vacuum so that you can begin to fill it with the things that you need to be powerful. Or you need to protect yourself so that you can remain power in a designed system or atmosphere where you're supposed to be powerless, but you have the tools to be successful even in a power vacuum. So all I'm saying is the basic construct is this. If you walk into a power vacuum, you need to understand <laughs> this, there isn't a va power vacuum for everybody. There are some people in that room that have the power and they've designed this atmosphere so you ain't got none. So you have to understand that you have power inside you and that if you want to be powerful, if you want to sit at the table of power, you got to understand what is giving these people power. Is it the structural hierarchy? Is it, is it specific knowledge? Is it a way of talking? What is that culture of power? Right? How are those black Africans operating in Europe, operating under a system that condoned racism even racism if you were the Queen of England. How can you remain Queen of England as a black woman in England in the 18th century, in the 19th century? How can you wield power in racism? And you're a queen. How do you deal with racism as a queen? How do you deal with racism as a four-star general in France? And how does your kid, Dumas, wield power in France. Well, he's literate, and he travels, and he writes great stuff. Reading one of his novels now, George, which is about a multiracial 
society in an island where you're dealing with slavery and free people and free people of color and white people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's his first novel. Uh, it was the three Mus three musketeers came later. So very few people even know about George Dumas' first novel. So why is that? We make movies of Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo. No black people in them. And he, he's writing about his black f general father. But you don't hear about that until this class. Interesting. Power vacuum. Okay? So if I give you information as a form of power, you need to understand how do you operate in a power vacuum. All right? So making the appropriate adjustments for your own actions. So axiology is an attempt to teach people to do that in a two-day workshop. Now, when Ed was out on the circuit basically presenting this, I mean, he's elderly now, he's in his 80s, because if he's one of my dad's contemporaries, he's definitely in his 80s. So uh, axiology is an attempt to teach people to do that in a two-day workshop. Now, he would often say, you know, if you're really going to do this right, you take a month. But most corporations ain't going to pay for their employees to become cross-culturally adept. They're only willing to do window dressing, which is a two-day workshop. And there's a limit to what you can do in 12 hours. So, you know, two six-hour days with breaks, right? Because the mind can only absorb what the behind can endure. As you know, when we go for an hour and 15 minutes, it might be intense. So, take breaks. So, two days at a rate that should at least take a week or a month. So, since most businesses, of course, wouldn't take the time to take a week, the workshop takes two days. So, axiology is the philosophical basis of a given culture's values. So, if you look at other English words with the prefix axi, axis and axiom. We see that in axis, we have an imaginary line about which a world or a worldview turn, so just like an axle, wheel rotates on an axle, which is a central line. In mathematics, an axiom is something we hold to be true without proof. So in psychology, what we call an axiom uh, is like values. Similarly, values are things we hold to be true without proof. We talk about family values. Oh, well, that's the best way to run a family. Well, what is that exactly? What is your concept of family values? Axiology, then, is the basic assumptions that a culture operates on. So, if axiology is the basic assumptions that a culture operates on, then often those assumptions operate on an unconscious level. Because they are unconscious, they often move people without their conscious awareness. Sort of a cultural automatic pilot or default setting. Now, if we were to import this, because remember, remember ethnic studies is, bi is uh, multidisciplinary. So in biology, this is called epigenetics. And the idea is that your DNA code does not just code for your physical body and your physical structure and coding for proteins. It also is memory storage. So it's system memory storage for every organism in your genetic line back to the first bacteria. So just like we know that you can pass on drug tolerance, particularly alcohol, through your genetic line. So when you use the drug alcohol, it's not just your tolerance, it's everybody's tolerance in the genetic line before you. And if you're using your, gene, your very genes, your eggs and your sperm are also being programmed with your drug and alcohol experiences as well to pass on to the next generation, if any. So one of the things that, even though Nichols didn't really talk about epigenetics as that is system memory from the ancestors, what he's saying is that an axiology is pa pass passed on unconsciously. Now the mechanism is yet to be discovered, like what kind of memories are stored in the DNA code. But clearly we can see that if a spider never meets its parents, yet knows how to make a web, we call that instinct. So how, what does the DNA code just make spiders able to be able to spin webs or is some kind of system memory being transferred? 
Well, with the word instinct, some kind of system memory is being transferred. How to make webs. So if culture is the collection of everything that is necessary for survival, then that's going to be passed on to. And that's, the, that's basically the assumption with axiology. Okay? Because these things are passed on unconsciously, one of the things, and let's say that culture is that which is necessary for survival. It's the collection of all the things you need to do to survive. So Nichols' basic thesis is your axiology started 10,000 years ago, at least, with the survival conditions necessary for you to survive. And, within, and that's passed on unconsciously. Now, in order to basically take and boil down all the world's cultural complexities into four basic axiologies is going to be kind of reductionist. And he admits that. So, you can see axiology in operation in every artifact a culture produces. How a culture sees itself and how its members relate to each other and the world and how they know and understand the world can be said to be their axiology. So, for example, uh, you go to a powwow and you see a, an eagle feather staff. That's an axiology of natives. Tenochtitlan, the ancient city, where Walmart built <laughs> the ancient pyramid city. Uh, the ancient pyramid city that's built on an artificial island on an artificial lake. So, people made a lake, they made an island in the middle of the lake, and they built a pyramid city on that island with canals and different streets so people could go to the giant market. And that's what Cortez saw. Tenochtitlan, which is near outside of Mexico City where Walmart bribed the government to build a Walmart. <laughs> anyway, an eagle feather staff in Tenochtitlan are basically Native American axiology. A djembe, the African drum, is Afro-Hispanic Axiology, Timbuktu, both the city and the university in Timbuktu represent the values of their culture. A sitar, the Indian instrument, that is dot Indian, in the Hindu Indians in India. Acupuncture needle, Bombay, Beijing. An acupuncture needle and acupuncture, so Asian axiology, sitar. Asian axiology, the cities bom Mumbai, Bombay, Mumbai, or Beijing, which we used to call Peking in China. Those represent Asian axiology. So television monitor, portable computer, Euro-American axiology, Los Angeles, which used to be Afro-Hispanic axiology and got shifted over to Euro-American axiology. So what I'm saying is axiologies can shift and change over time depending on demographic. I'm from the city of Los Angeles, which was founded by 44 founding fathers, only two of which were white. The whites were not dominant. It was mixed race, African, Native American, and European. The founding fathers of the city of Los Angeles. So the city of the angels. Right? So shifting axiology. New York City, which is also New Amsterdam, shifting axiologies within Euro-American axiology. And Silicon Valley. Okay? All these represent certain axiologies in uh, operation. So the idea then, so you can also say that corporations themselves are a form of technology. Nichols is an organizational industrial psychologists. So, corporations are a form of technology. The corporation Mondragon, which is a cooperative corporation, is different than 3M or IBM, even though they're often engaged in the same business, manufacturing, distribution, finance, etc. Educational systems and pedagogy are a form of technology. LCC is different than Timbuktu in Africa, or Sankor in Africa, or Luxor in uh, Kemet or Africa. So all of these ref systems reflect certain cultural values that are discoverable. They have their own 
a means of utilizing and distributing power. Okay, so when Nichols talks about axiology, an axiology encompasses not only the highest value, because that's principally what it means, so the highest value, and you can do a value statement for each axiology, is not only the highest value, but it also incorporates a view of time, and how time, that view of time affects behavior, an epistemology, that is, how you know the world and how you know what is true, the means by which you do that. A logic system, so logic is a way of reasoning to an answer. Okay, so there's lots of different forms of logic and Nichols basically points this out within the axiology construct. Each of the four axiologies has a different epistemology, a different view of time, a different logic system, and a different process. So a process is how you act in the world as a result of your axiology. And so when we look at below process here, technology, technology literally means a way of doing things. So there are, it's the study of technique. Ology means study of technique. So there are hard technologies and soft technologies. So this presentation is being brought to you by video cameras which are running through uh, a mixing board that is based on a CPU chip, a uh, computer chip, using computer technologies. That's the hard technology, right? The soft technology is how it's being delivered to you. That is the stuff in terms of how you're thinking, how you feel about it, and what you do with the information. So there's hard technology and soft technology. Okay, so hard technology is the actual hardware, soft technology like software, but it could be, all right, how do you fix eggs? Well, what kind of eggs? How do you make an omelet without breaking eggs? Well, you can't in your mind, but how do you make an omelet? Do you want it fluffy? Do you want your, scrab your, your eggs scrambled over easy? I mean, they ask you that in a restaurant. That's the soft technology. How do you do that? How do you flip an egg? in a pan. How do you separate the whites and so use the whites to fluff up the omelet and fold in the yolk later so that you make a fluffy omelet? How do you do that? How do you fry an egg? How do you flip an egg? Etc. Soft technologies, the how-to. All right. So technology is also a study of technique. The techniques may not be physically discernible. Okay? It's how-to. All right, and that all is encompassed in, within the concept of axiology. So in a culture's axiology, all these things interact, and they may change, too. So as an example, uh, across the top, Euro-American axiology, the highest value is the object. Afro so reading down the left column. African, Latino, more Arab, South American axiology. The highest value is in relationships. Asian Pacific Islander axiology, the highest value is group cohesion. And Native American axiology, the highest value is uh, the, the relationship between uh, a person, the visible world, the invisible world. So it's not just group cohesion. It's its own thing, which he'll, he'll describe as a quadri-unital uh, logic. The view of time. With Euro-Americans, time is uh, money, time is linear. It moves in a unidirectional uh, motion from past in a line to the present to the future. In fact, the, the, time, the concept that we use about timelines and parallel universes and all that stuff come from that particular view of time, that time moves in a line. And time is an object, because time is money. You get paid an hourly wage, which means you are selling your life to an employer an hour at a time. So time is an object, because time is money. In the Afro, African Latino, or African Hispanic, as he talked about it, but he, as Nichol talked about it, but it also includes uh, Moors, Arabs, South Americans, because uh, as I may have stated uh, the other day, there are 130 million 
black people in what we call Latin America. So there's more black people in Latin America than there are in America. And they've had an influence. So that's part of the axiology as well. When the Moors conquered Spain, and basically, you see how culture gets translated. So algebra, al means the, this gets translated into Spanish as el. Al and el both mean the. So in the Los Angeles area, where you have cities named Alhambra, and El Segundo, okay, that's the Moorish influence on the language of Spanish. Algebra, Alhambra, El Segundo. El Paso. Might as well, L means the El Paso. Down in the West Texas town of El Paso. <laughs> All right, back to slide. Thank you. So time moves in a spiral in this axiology. In a spiral. What goes around comes around. Asian Pacific Islander axiology. All eternity in a single moment. Uh, karma, the wall. So time moves in a circular motion. Uh, so the difference between a spiral and a circle is a circle is all-encompassing and there's a cyclical nature. In a spiral, it includes that there is moving in a, there is motion in a circle, circular motion, but it's moving. The circle itself is moving. So you capture that in the spiral. In Native American, time moves also in a circle. Uh, the sacred hoop. The epistemology within Euro-Americans is uh, the how you know the world is through counting and measuring. Often how this is reinforced is back, in, for example, in the toys of children. So counting and measuring. So children get blocks. And what are on the blocks? Numbers and letters, right? So numbers so you know how to spell and call your name your objects. Numbers so you can count your objects. You know, what do you say as a basic value of science? It ain't real if it can't be measured. Well, how do you measure love? On a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, no, there's some things that can't be measured in numbers. As Einstein once said, not everything that, ca that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. Oh, Albert. The way that we've been talking about with uh, Afro-Latino or Afro-Hispanic uh, axiology, symbolic imagery and rhythm. So we've been looking at visual grammar and talking about that, what things symbolize and how much meaning you can pack into pictures. Uh, Asian Pacific Islander axiology, epistemology, striving towards transcendence, and Native American uh, epistemology, the cycle of life, uh, or the different cycles of life, so childhood, adolescence, adulthood, elderhood, and then returning uh, in a cyclical motion. Seasons, um, and, and other things, other cycles. The logic and process, dichotomous logic. Uh, so dichotomous means two, the logic of polar opposites and opposing. That's Euro-American axiology, uh, the uh, logic of, of process. The, the process is uh, machine-based technology. In African, Hispanic, or Latino uh, axiology, the logic is Diunital logic, opposites uniting, all sets interacting through human and spiritual networks. Uh, Asian Pacific Islander axiology, all sets independently interrelated in the harmony of the universe. And Native American axiology, pan and theos, the logic uh, all in the great spirit. Uh, Quadriunital logic, so the, the, the spiritual, human, animal, plant, elemental, and mineral, and invisible worlds are basically the same being and they are related. And this is captured in various uh, native languages. Uh, for example, Mashika Tawe, all my relations, which doesn't just mean humans, it means everything that's sentient, which is potentially everything. Or um, 
chai, the other part of me, meaning you, the other part of me. So, according to Dr. Nichols, a culture's axiology is generated in part by the climactic and survival conditions present at its genesis. The axiology evolves with the culture and can cross-pollinate ideas with other cultural contexts. So, one of the things, there's a couple of different ways about how culture gets disseminated. One is by conquest, another is by contact where there's collaboration. Or both things can happen either not at the same time. So at worst, this cultural cross-pollination can come about through conquest, but often more powerful results ha can and have been achieved through intentional symbiosis. So for example, when I say I define myself as an African American, and that means African Americans that have been here for 2,500 years. Uh, 2,500 years ago, we didn't come here as conquerors, we came here as explorers and traders. Uh, Natives had gold, we had gold, uh, natives built pyramids, we built pyramids, natives had ways of sailing and navigating uh, across the continent and uh, certainly across oceans, um, so we had a lot to share. And it wasn't, a, a, you know, there's no point in us trying to come from Africa to try and conquer Turtle Island because we had Africa and Africa's bigger than North America. So. <laughs> We didn't have, come here for the land, we had Africa. We didn't come here for gold, we brought the gold to the Taino. The Taino gave it to Columbus, so we had our own gold. So what we are interested in is seeing what's on the other side of that ocean, which we called Atalanta, or the circuit of the world. So, acculturation. There are two concepts within um, anthropology. Acculturation means to take on aspects of a culture without erasing your own. And assimilation means to erase your own culture in favor of a dominant preferred norm, usually to your detriment. So often uh, when we look at this in a racial context, it could be becoming white. It could also be, you know, that means for a person of color to become white because whatever whiteness studies means, whatever whiteness means as a construct, uh, white people don't have to worry about becoming white, they are white, whatever that means. Uh, and so we need, you know, you need to examine what that, what whiteness means, and that's what whiteness studies is, uh, not necessarily in relation to another. But if you're people of color, becoming white means essentially erasing your cultural pattern in favor of fitting in with what we refer to as dominant culture. And on the other hand, you have examples of people going native. So Lawrence of Arabia giving up his British roots to become like an Arab. Or Dances with Wolves where the cavalryman's character uh, played by Kevin Costner goes native and joins the Lakota. Right? So we see a lot of these going native things. Becoming white, going native. So assimilation, erasing your own culture in favor of a dominant preferred norm, usually to your detriment. Sometimes in anthropology, these terms are used interchangeably. Uh, in Nichols' construct, they're separate. I'm using them as separate. So I can learn how to use chopsticks. That's acculturation. But that's, I don't use chopsticks, chopsticks to eat ribs or potato salad or fry a catfish. <laughs> right? So use chopsticks to eat Asian food. So, acculturation. Take on aspects of a culture without erasing your own. So, how does an axiology develop? So, any human culture concerns itself with survival. What you have to do concerning food, water, and shelter. We start with Europe only because we're speaking English, using Latin characters, Roman characters, because England was conquered by the Romans. That's why we do that, actually. Maybe you didn't know that. England was conquered by the Romans. And the Latin characters were imposed upon the English who may or may not have had their own alphabet, uh, and the Irish and Scots who may or may not have had their own alphabet, but certainly had a language. Western civilization, again, is an attempt to recreate the Roman Empire using a westernized form of Christianity as a vehicle for conquest. Now, Jesus didn't kill anybody. 
didn't have any armies. So having Christian soldiers means, oh, we'll take the religious model, some of the concepts, but we're going to adapt them to conquest. Because the Roman emperors, empire is about conquest con and bringing everybody unto, under the imperial umbrella. So this is an attempt to create a united Europe using a form of weaponized Christianity. It doesn't matter that the Irish and Scots have their own religion and maybe don't like the Romans and maybe don't want to adopt their ways. Too bad. You're conquered and you're going to become like us. So if we look at the conditions thousands of years ago in Central Europe, before weaponized Christianity or before Christianity even left Africa, we see that people living in these areas had a short growing season and a severe winter. Snow could be on the ground from September to May, leaving essentially three months to plant, grow, harvest, and store food through the long winter. Three months, essentially June, July, August. All right? So, June 1st, you've got to get right on the job planting your food whether you feel like it or not. You must be on time and get it done quickly. So in this, uh, this axiology, the view of time, time becomes an object. Because time is money. Right? And it is survival. Okay? And you have to get it done because if you don't plant the food, you'll starve to death. So culture is that collection of things that are useful for survival. And survival in Central Europe, for example, the Black Forest of Germany, if you're going to do agriculture, you only have three months to do it. So, being on time, being prompt, time is money. All these things are survival facts for this particular axiology originating in Central Europe. And remember, Nichols is educated, so he's basically educated here in Germany, and so he's able to observe the historical legacy of that axiology being developed. So, with the, in the view of time, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't seize the moment now, it will pass, never to return, because that's the view of time. Time moves in a, in a line from the past to the future, and it doesn't come back. So, one becomes very task and time-oriented. You learn to suppress emotions that obstruct the task getting done, because to deal with emotions takes too much time, and you might hesitate and starve because you only have three months. So it don't matter whether you're sick as a dog, get it done now, right? Ernie the Cable got get her done, right? Same, this, see how the axiology is reinforced. An important technology then becomes the preservation of food to store away, right? So you get cheese, so you get wine, so you get drying fruit and drying food and jerky, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one also tends to value stocks of food and hoarded possessions, so much so that you will defend them to the death because it means your death if you run out of food or other scarce resources. So you are not going to give up your food either without a fight or with something of equal value and then you devise systems of, of an economy. So one possible response to scarce resources in a hostile environment. Now, what I'm saying, one response. So there's native axiologies which evolve like in cold and in the snow with no growing season and they don't develop this axiology. They don't. So, one possible response to scarce resources in a hostile environment is the European axiology. The highest value is the object or acquisition of the object or control of the object. And in this axiology, not only time is an object, the land is an object, women can be objects, children can be objects or property, land, animals, all of these kind of things. So basically, the value is he who dies with the most toys wins, and I ain't sharing my toys with you. So he who has the most toys or the most property is rich, and the poor are people who have less property and money. See how this works? That's an economy. So to see how this works in an industrial, con industrial construct, a tale of four workers. We have Hans, Euro-American axiology, Javier, uh, Afro-Hispanic axiology, Hideo, 
Asian axiology, and Herman, Native American axiology. Hans, Javier, Hideo, and Herman work for the same multinational corporation which makes timekeeping devices and was originally Swiss in origin. Each of them is having the same bad day. So, to give you a little context, European, Euro-American axiology. Now, there are different axiologies with, within a particular axiology, but the one we're operating under now is male-dominant, Romanized Christian. So there are other axiologies within the European axiology that could be egalitarian and pagan. But we don't know about those because the male-dominant Romanized Christian folks erased all that stuff. Right? So on the, on the axiology that's being observed now, a person has a relationship to the object that is, if you notice object in all caps, the highest value lies in the object or the acquisition of the object. He who, die, he who dies with the most toys wins. Right? In this axiology, objects can have a higher importance than life itself. All right? You ain't a man without a possessions or a job or a family or a wife. So no possessions, no job, no worth. So for example, the farm suicide stat. So in this time, especially when we have um, unemployment, so one of the things that Nichols observed, and this is when the unemployment rate was again, because he cited this, the unemployment rate was at the time 7.1%. And he basically said, okay, if you see a rise of a tenth of a percentage point like to 7.2, okay, a tenth of a percentage point rise in the unemployment rate equals 700 suicides of white men. Okay? And this is because they lost their job or they lost access to the family farm. Now, as a contrast, how many black men kill themselves because they lost a job? Different axiology. Right? But in this axiology, they've been socialized to think that their job is, and their possessions are their identity, because the highest value is person to object. So nearly anything can be objectified. Land, power, women, nature, time, money. People can be objectified and thus be said to have relative value. So if you have more things, you're more valuable, kings, nobles, and they own serfs and slaves. That is, human resources, as we say today. Living things can become natural resources. Forest, game, minerals under the ground, and even be considered valuable, replaceable, consumable, or expendable, like any other object. Okay? This is a different value system than, say, all my relations, which says that deer and trees and rocks and streams and the waters are my relatives. Yeah, different value system. All right, so Hans. I miss the bus. Hans worked as the corporate office in Geneva. One day he forgets to set his alarm, so misses the bus. He arrives two hours late. Because time is money, he is docked two hours pay. He is given a stern lecture about promptness with insinuations about the laxness of his upbringing and his family, etc. Well, I miss the bus. Time is money, it's nothing personal, just business, right? The basic axiological value, control or acquisition of the object, dominates here. Too bad if you miss the bus, time is money. Nothing personal, just business, right? Because the value, the axiology says, <laughs> doesn't matter what your feelings are, time is money. In fact, to be professional within this axiology, you're not supposed to have emotions. Emotions are irrelevant. You're suppressing them. Right? Too bad if you're sorry. Your feelings are irrelevant, as is our relationship. So what if we were, we're friends? I'm your supervisor. <laughs> Time is money, baby. Afroaxiology. 
African Hispanic axiology is person to person. The highest value lies in the, relation, in the interpersonal relationships between people. In this axiology, the value of the relationship can supersede life itself. So, for example, the Center for Disease Control uh, said that for black males between the, eight, the ages of 18 to 42, they're most likely to be killed, they're most likely to be murdered, and when you interview these murders, murderers in prison, 76% of them were friends or relatives of the people they murdered, and the reason for murdering them was not because they stole an object, but because they dissed the relationship. So this, uh, so basically it was the relationship that was damaged. When somebody gets called nigger, in the European axiology where they say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, <laughs> not for black people. If you're calling me nigger, unless we have a relationship of shared oppression, you basically just said a fighting word, and I can use preemptive force to take you out. Because I can assume that if you're not a friend of mine or my homie, that you are about to do bodily harm, and I'm going to launch the first blow, because you just launched the first blow by calling me that. So this axiology involved, evolved in more tropical climes. With a year-round growing season, a variety of plentiful food sources, and plenty of room, a culture which places emphasis on the bonds between people evolved because of survival needs demanded a strong kinship ties. And kinship ties become more important than possessions. And in any case, there's no winter, a year-round growing season, so the time value becomes what goes around comes around. You, got, you run out of bananas? That's okay. There'll be more bananas in two weeks. Kinship ties are more important than possessions. Since value is placed on relationships, patience, understanding, character and insight, and an understanding of correct behavior, those become central. The concept of families extended to include aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, and friendly strangers. So any of these people can correct your behavior with the same authority as your parents. It takes a village to raise a single child. So the Moors, Africans, occupied Spain for up to 700 years heavily influencing all aspects of Spanish culture, including language until the Spanish Inquisition. So hence, that's why Nichols calls it the Afro-Hispanic um, axiology. So with Javier, and uh, I'll leave this up because we got less than two minutes. Javier missed the bus, but in Spanish, when he says he missed the bus, essentially the translation is the bus left me. He missed the bus because time is money. He's been docked two hours pay, but it's his friend. So he says, you can't dock my pay. The bus left me. The alarm clock forgets to set itself. And he breaks a cup and he says, oh, silly cup. The cup broke itself. So what is being preserved here is the relationship, not the emphasis on physical objects. So um, be able to leave this up, and uh, we'll continue on next time. See you in week three. And we'll continue our discussion with axiology. Later. Peace out. <laughs>